Social media platform TikTok is being sued following the death of two girls who died trying out a blackout challenge. The lawsuits were filed in Los Angeles. One girl was found hanging from her bed with a rope around her neck. Another one was found dead with a dog leash around her neck. Joining me now is social media expert Sarah Huffman. Sarah, this is such a disturbing story and it begs the question, why is content like the blackout challenge that can endanger people's lives allowed on a platform like TikTok? Amy, thank you so much for having me on the show to chat about this. It's absolutely, it's so disturbing. And we do have to wonder how this terrifying content makes its way on a platform like TikTok. But what we really have to remind ourselves of is that TikTok, much, much like YouTube, much like Snapchat, and much like any of the other social media platforms we use, is a platform that houses user-generated content. And we have to remember this. And what this means is that no matter how robust the filtering mechanisms are, or the team that, you know, reports, when, when we report content, the team that panels it and reviews it and decides whether or not it should be allowed on the platform, no matter how robust those systems are, when something is user generated, it is going to be on the platform before it is taken down. And so no matter what the motivation for these challenges are, and we do have to ask what the motivation is, it is often too late, you know, that content has already been seen. Do we have to be more demanding about the way that these social media platforms are policed? Because if they're making money, and let's face it, they're making vast quantities of money uh, from advertising on these platforms exactly because people are so drawn to them, then surely they have a duty of care. And, and what's so alarming is that algorithms on TikTok specifically fed this content to children. So surely that must make the platform liable at least to some degree. So absolutely, and it will be really interesting to see how these these lawsuits pan out. Um, TikTok, it's not the first time that TikTok, TikTok has been in the naughty corner for being responsible for feeding very sinister algorithms to people, young people who, who shouldn't see them. There was a huge expose last year around feeding content around plastic surgery to young children, promoting plastic surgery, eating disorders, promoting you know abnormal treatments for anxiety and depression. And so, they absolutely do need to take responsibility and they have responded with upping their parental controls, upping their what they call family pairing, which is you know, greater management and greater control that parents can have. But it's a very difficult line to draw. You know, I think that with the number of users that TikTok has mm -hmm. and the amount of content posted on the platform every minute. I don't believe they can hire enough people and, and create an algorithm sophisticated enough to actually prevent some of this type of content falling through the cracks. And so we have to really look at our own solutions in the interim, you know, and we, we do hope that they will take greater responsibility and they will create more sophisticated mechanisms from preventing this type of content being available to anyone, let alone young children. But in the meantime, we do have to put our own measures in place as much as possible that, you know, to pr protect our children from seeing content like this. Mm. So the, the two girls, uh that I mentioned in the intro, the one was eight years old and the other one was nine years old um, and they've lost their lives. Um, and the question here is, do youngsters at that age have the discernment to view this kind of content and make responsible choices about how to engage with that content and, and how does that inform the decisions that parents need to make? So the, the answer to that question is they absolutely do not have the discernment. And, you know, when we speak, we speak to a lot of tweens and teens and parents of children. And at that age, the brain is under such a period of rapid development that anything that kind of registers as a little bit risky actually releases a dopamine hit. And so the momentum of these TikTok challenges, the way they rise in popularity, as disturbing as so many of them may seem to adults, is actually largely um, gains momentum because of this feeling of thrill that engaging in risky behavior 
gives to children and teens. And so they absolutely don't have the discernment to differentiate what is dangerous from not. And that is why, firstly, we need to try and keep our children off platforms like TikTok for an extended period of time. I don't believe that at eight or nine, children have the mechanisms mentally, psychologically, emotionally to discern what is right from wrong, what is safe from not. And secondly, we, we need to, as parents to constantly check in on what are they seeing, what did that make you feel, and know and let your children know that if they do come across inappropriate content, if they do come across content that makes them feel in the slightest bit strange that they can come to you and talk to you about it that you are a safe landing spot so many kids we speak to say they don't want to tell their parents that they saw something inappropriate or they saw something violent or explicit because they're fearful that their parents will take away the device and so while i'm not for one minute saying let's not have boundaries and let's not have consequences i think it is of utmost importance to establish with your children that you are a safe landing space that you can talk to them about no matter what there may be consequences but talking will come first so while you said that you think that eight and nine year olds are really not um, at an age where they uh, have as you said the, the mental capacity and the discernment to, to to be on these platforms safely there's no world in which parents can simply outright ban children from accessing platforms because you know no doubt there are going to be parents out there who do let their children uh, have access and, and children who, who are completely barred from accessing will, will be so much more eager to, to use these platforms when in the company of their friends. And that's exactly when things happen, uh, you know, as you said, where they feel they can't share things that they've seen with their parents. So how do we train children uh, before we allow them onto social media so that when they do access these platforms that they're ready to engage in, in a way that's healthy and safe for them. Are there ways that you can prep them beforehand? Absolutely. So I think that, you know, digital citizenship, which is really having the smarts to know how to handle tricky online situations, to know what to do when you come across explicit content, to, you know, know who to speak to when you feel that something isn't going right online, to check that someone who speaks to you is who they say they are. These are critical 21st century life skills that, you know, we didn't, we in our generation didn't have to learn. And if our children are going to be on devices, which they are, as you said, it's kind of inevitable. These are skill sets that they have to have. And so we actually have a wonderful tool. Um, it's a app and it gives children what we call the, their social media license. So all the skills and tools they need to succeed online, to know how to handle tricky online situations. And that is one way that our children can upskill themselves before they are sort of let loose in this really scary and overwhelming online world. What we always say to parents, though, is, you know, there, there also are, you know, we can have a whole separate conversations around parental controls and how we filter explicit content and how we provide our children more sanitized views so that no one should ever be in a situation like these eight and nine year old little girls who tragically lost their lives and that should never have happened. But the greatest parental co control available out there, and I strongly believe this, is connected and engaged parents. And we time and time again see a strong correlation between kids who use technology well and parents who are connected and engaged. And so it really is about checking in with your children, chatting consistently, not being judgmental, being curious about their online world and staying connected throughout that process. Thank you so much, uh, social media expert Sarah Hoffman. And I suppose the starting point for any parent in passing on valuable social media skills is to develop those skills ourselves and then to pass them on to our children. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah Hoffman, for your time.